goal of IV therapy is to maintain or prevent fluid and electrolyte imbalances without any complications associated with the delivery of IV medications and fluids. Infusion therapy involves parenteral replacement of fluids, electrolytes or crystalloids, blood products which are colloids, and nutrition. The Infusion Nurses Society, located in Norwood, Massachusetts, is a national nonprofit organization founded in 1973. Membership is open to all healthcare professionals from all practice settings who are involved in or interested in the specialty practice of infusion therapy. INS is dedicated to advancing delivery of quality therapy to patients, enhancing the specialty through th stringent standards of practice and professional ethics, and promoting research and education in the infusion nursing practice. Most textbooks use a lot of information from the INS standards of 2006. Intravenous fluids have different levels of tonicity, Isotonic have the same concentration or osmolarity as body fluids. Most often they are used to replace extracellular losses such as prolonged vomiting. Now isotonic fluids fill the spaces inside and outside of the cells evenly. Examples of their use are labor and delivery, uh, during surgery, and uh, to uh, deal with trauma. Hypotonic solutions have a lower concentration or osmolarity than body fluids. They tend to fill the spaces inside of the cells and can cause the cells to swell and burst as uh, if you're administering isotonic solutions. So examples of their use are for cellular dehydration, which is uh, common with hypernatremia. Um, you'll see that with uh, their sodium levels are very high. Hypertonic solutions have a greater concentration or osmolarity than body fluids. Now, caution should be used with hypertonic fluids because these solutions pull fluid into the bloodstream and that can make the heart work harder because it has more fluid to push around. Hypertonic fluids are also thicker and can be harder on the veins. Uh, they can be more irritating. So examples of their use uh, are to treat hyponatremia as well as during the post-op period. Situation. This elderly lady has a hypertonic dehydration. She comes from a nursing home and while there she contracted Clostridium difficile. She has had 8 to 10 watery stools per day for the last several days. As a result, she has lost a lot of plain old water. When checking her out, you find a dry, thirsty lady with a high sodium value of 155 milliequivalents per liter. She needs a hypotonic fluid infusion to replace the lost water without replacing much sodium. A hypotonic fluid must be replaced gradually to avoid rapid shifts. With the hypertonic dehydration, the bloodstream is salty and the fluid shifts from inside the cells to dilute the bloodstream. Hypotonic fluids, such as half-normal saline, will dilute the salt in the bloodstream and allow water to move back into the cells. This needs to be done gradually, in particular to protect the brain. Situation. This young man is admitted to Death Valley Medical Center in July with a hypotonic dehydration. He has been sweating profusely while on a marathon run through the desert and has been drinking copious amounts of plain water and had nothing to eat. Upon checking him out, you see that he has a low blood pressure, fast heart rate, and a low sodium level of 125. He is deficient in water, but even more deficient in sodium, so his diagnosis is hypotonic dehydration. He needs a hypertonic solution to re replenish the water, and especially sodium. Fluids such as D5NS is hypertonic, these fluids must be replaced slowly to prevent a dramatic shift of fluid into the bloodstream and overworking the heart. Isotonic solutions such as Ringer's lactate, otherwise known as LR, and normal saline, NS, are given to patients with isotonic dehydration. Isotonic solutions hydrate cells and replenish the vascular space equally. A patient with isotonic dehydration will have a fluid volume deficit, but a normal sodium value between 135 and 145 milliequivalents per liter. Patients in labor 
or those who have been severely burned or are undergoing surgery typically have isotonic dehydration and require isotonic fluids. Again, note, if a rapid fluid resuscitation is required, only isotonic fluids can be used. Neither hypertonic nor hypotonic can be used in those situations as they pose a severe or even fatal health risk to the patient. Parenteral nutrition, PN, also called total parenteral nutrition, can be given centrally or peripherally, in which case it's called PPN for peripheral parenteral nutrition. PN is a combination of protein, fat, and sugar. Vitamins, electrolytes, and other drugs such as heparin, famotidine, or insulin might be added separately. Due to the high sugar content, up to 10% for peripheral PN, the likelihood of phlebitis is great. A central venous access device, a CVAD, is necessary for administration of PN that has a dextrose con concentration of more than 10%. The high sugar content of PN makes for a great medium for growth of microorganisms and the three-in-one solutions which, can, can, which contain lipids makes it even a more desirable medium. So extra caution is required to avoid contamination when attaching the bag, tubing, and central access device. We truly worry about infection when we are dealing with patients who get parenteral nutrition. Imagine how you have felt when you ate a bunch of donuts on an empty stomach and then ate nothing for the rest of the day. Your patient will have a similar experience and the effect is called rebound hypoglycemia, which is similar to eating the donuts and drinking a Pepsi and having nothing to eat for hours afterwards. When you take in that kind of high carb junk, your pancreas secretes a ton of insulin. Pretty soon you have a bunch of insulin and no sugar in your bloodstream. PN must always be tapered down before it is stopped. Many PN protocols require a bag of D10 to be available in the event the PN needs to be halted without tapering. PN is typically administered with a filter. Some hospitals add lipids to the PN bag while others infuse it separately. Typically, the PN bag gets changed every 24 hours. The PN tubing every 72 unless there's lipids. If lipids are being administered, those bags and tubing get changed every 24 hours. And if the PN is a 3-in-1 solution with lipids incorporated, then again the bag and tubing get changed every 24 hours. The most common venous access device is the peripheral intravenous catheter, or PIV. The PIV can last for 72 to 96 hours. Typical PIVs are made of Teflon, polyurethane, or silicone. There is a metal stylet, or needle, which pierces the skin, and a catheter which is threaded into the vein. Sizes range from 18 to 24 gauge for adults. They are good for surgeries where recovery will take less than a week, for short-term hydration, short-term antibiotics, or for receiving a couple of units of blood. Generally, if intravenous treatment is expected to go on for more than a week, a CVAD will be considered. Also, if the patient is expected to need very irritating fluid with high osmolarity or a low or high pH, a CVAD will also be considered. Any fluid outside the pH range of 5 to 9 should not go through the peripheral IV vein. It is always best to start with the least invasive device until you know for sure that intravenous therapy will be prolonged. You will soon be practicing IV starts on each other. Use the smallest gauge that you can get away with on your adult patients. For example, most patients who require moderate hydration or antibiotics are just fine with a 22 gauge. Patients who need blood are fine with a 20 gauge and can even use a 22 gauge if a 20 isn't possible. Labor and surgical patients should have an 18 gauge due to the requirements for rapid infusions and the possibility of a rapid transfusion. The goal is to infuse the prescribed therapy for the required amount of time while using the minimal number of catheters. If you don't succeed at first, try again, but only one more time. Two unsuccessful sticks and you're out. Time to get another nurse. There are a number of different places to insert a peripheral access device. Each site has its pros and cons. The basilic and cephalic veins are best for large gauges. The basal, 
equals the pinky side, while cephalic is the thumb side. Metacarpals, back of hands, are easiest to access but tend to get irritated quickly. Anticubital veins are good in emergencies but don't last long, and these IV sites are annoying to patients who can't bend their arms and to nurses who have to respond to IVs alarming. Other more creative sites might be found on the upper arm or even the fingers or thumb. MD orders are needed to start peripheral IV sites in lower extremities such as the feet. Sometimes you just have to get something started somewhere, but ideally you should start distally and work your way proximally. Basilic and cephalic veins are the best. Avoid lower extremities and arms with poor circulation. Never use an arm that has a dialysis access device, a pick, or on the same side as a mastectomy. Again, avoid starting IVs and arms with a mastectomy, lymph node dissection, paralyzed arm, an arm with an arteriovenous fistula, and an arm with a cellulitis. Ideally, you would start the IV on the non-dominant side. Sometimes you have no choices and you have to get a doctor's order in order to make an exception for one of the above rules. Exceptions might be made when there is no choice. Metacarpal veins are poor choices for older persons. There are four types of central venous access devices. First, peripherally inserted central catheter, a pick line. Second, non-tunneled catheters. Third, tunneled catheters. And fourth or last, vascular access port, a VAP. A pick can last for up to a year. It's inserted by a certified RN in a peripheral vein and terminates in the superior vena cava. Picks are usually double lumen, so you can infuse two incompatible fluids. Now with larger French sizes, a pick can be used to push contrast for CT scans, which require very rapid infusion rates. A pick can last for a year, and generally, heparin is no longer used, but you should use a lot of saline. You should use 20 mLs of saline to flush using push-pause methods after a blood draw. Flush with 10 mLs of saline every shift and after every medication administration. Always use a minimum of a 10 mL syringe with every flush or medication administration. Picks are now made with larger lumens so that contrast and drugs can be pushed in faster. These picks are called power picks. The picture on slide 15 shows a power pick with a stat lock and a bio patch dressing. The bio patch is impregnated with chlorhexidine as an antiseptic. When placing the bio patch, put the blue side up. Non-tunneled catheters are good for a few weeks. These lines should be flushed with 10 mL of saline after every blood draw. This picture shows a triple lumen central venous catheter. Two of the lumens are 18 French and one is 16 French. Fluids can be administered rapidly. The non-tunneled catheter is great for short term, but intense use. A patient with trauma or surgery is a good candidate for such a line. The typical site is subclavian, jugular, or femoral veins, with the tip of the catheter ending in the superior vena cava. Non-tunneled catheters are often inserted in the patient's room under a local anesthetic. They are designed for short-term use when there is a need for multiple infusions of high tonicity or low or high pH fluid. In slide 17, we are flushing a triple lumen, non-tunneled, central venous access device with 10 mLs of normal saline. A tunneled catheter is great for long-term use due to having a valve that prevents blood backup and a Dacron valve that is biocompatible. Tunneled catheters can be left alone for the most part. They only need to be flushed after use as in administering medications and drawing blood. Tunneled catheters are inserted in the operating room. They become part of the patient's dermis. Typical brand names are Groshong, Hickman, and Broviac, which are used for kids. Tunneled catheters are less likely to become infected and, if taken care of properly, can stay in place for the good part of a patient's life. Tunneled catheters must be placed or inserted in the operating room. A vascular access port, like a portacath, is a type of tunneled catheter with no line or lumen coming out of the patient's skin unless the port is accessed. A non-coring needle, a Huber needle, is essential to access the device. 
The device must be flushed with 3 mLs of 100 unit per mL heparin before removing the needle. The device should also be flushed daily with 10 mLs of normal saline and 3 mLs of heparin. When a port cath is not accessed, it can be ignored and the patient can go swimming or hot tubbing. The patient can do all usual activities of daily living. The patient who has a port must go to the medical provider office every month to have the heparin put into the port. This is not a good device for someone who can't stand needles. A venous access port is ideal for a patient who needs intermittent therapy such as cancer or cystic fibrosis patients. Always use a Huber or non-coring needle on a vascular access port or you will get a hole in the septum. To access the device, use sterile technique. Hold the septum and insert the needle straight in. The septum can take well over 1,000 needle sticks if done properly. This is a vascular access port lying under the skin. It looks like a pacemaker. Always access this port using a non-coring needle and always flush with 3 mLs of 100 units per mL of heparin when the port is accessed and nothing is running. Patient-controlled analgesia, a PCA, involves the use of a pump connected to tubing and IV site. Morphine and hydromorphone, dilated, are typically used. Patients can deliver their own narcotic on demand with the push of a button. Studies have demonstrated that patients use less narcotic when not having to rely on a nurse to give the drug. An example of a PCA order might be morphine, one milligram, with a lockout of six minutes. This means that the patient can't have morphine more often than every six minutes. The patient might also have a continuous flow going as well, and this is called the basal rate. For example, two milligrams of morphine per hour. The use of a basal or continuous rate is controversial because adverse effects are more likely. Continuous infusion of narcotics is generally reserved for end-of-life care or severe narcotic dependency. Family members must be instructed not to push a button unless permission has been granted, such as in the case of parents administering to a child. Nurses might also push the button by proxy, but it is not an ideal situation. Many drugs are administered by IV bolus, or also called a push. This method of drug administration carries with it the most risk because adverse effects are immediate and difficult to reverse. Advantages include quick response, ability to titrate to achieve effectiveness, and comfort for the patient once venous access has been obtained. During med surge 2 clinical, check with your instructor prior to giving any medication by IV push. Many facilities have policies where students are not allowed to give meds by IV push unless the instructor is physically present with you and the patient. Infiltration occurs when fluid seeps out of a vein and into the surrounding tissue. It is evidenced by cool, clammy skin and appears as swelling. Oftentimes, fluid will still flow into the area if a pump is used and the problem is disguised. Phlebitis occurs when fluid or the access device irritates the vein. It is evidenced by a hard, cord-like vein with surrounding redness, pain, and swelling. Basically, it's inflammation. It tends to occur as IV sites get too old.